Welcome to Your Need to Know. I'm Jody Lyons and I'm your host today. My guest is Dr. Nicholas Shore. He's a real unicorn, a geriatric psychiatrist. And today we're gonna to be talking about how to interact with your loved one with dementia and perhaps even more importantly, how to help caregivers deal with their own stress and take care of themselves. So Dr. Shore, thanks so much for being here. Oh, my pleasure. So one of the things that comes up, I know you and I deal with this all day, every day, is when we have a family member or a family caregiver who has a loved one with dementia, they don't really know the right and wrong way to change their interactions with their loved one, how what they normally do changes in the context of dementia. And one of the first questions that seems to come up a lot is what you and I may call therapeutic fibbing, and they may call lying and saying, I always need to be honest. I don't want to lie to my loved one. Could you first of all, explain the difference and then tell me how you feel about it or examples? Sure. I, I think maybe to start with a sort of a, a, a general overview of, uh, you know, how families can interact with their loved ones with dementia. Um, it's one of the, the mantras I have is, it is better to be kind than to be right. Oh, I love that. And so trying to put yourself in the shoes of the loved one with dementia, understand their perspective, and what is it that's going to help them the most? And that sometimes we recommend avoiding what we call reality testing, which is trying to correct the person if they say something that's wrong, if they're confused about something. Uh, a lot of times trying to explain to them is not going to sink in. For example, okay. if, if they have a belief that, um, you know, they have to pack their bag because they're leaving for a trip. That if you try using logic and reason and showing, saying, well, where's your ticket? Show us the flight reservation. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, uh, that uh, it, it doesn't work. You can't reason with them because of the dementia, their ability to reason, their insight into their impairment is, is just not there. So what is the kinder thing to do? So we will sometimes recommend what we call therapeutic fibbing, which is it's lying to the person, but it's doing so in their own best interest. So, for example, saying, no, 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 honey, the flight's tomorrow. It's it's it's, uh, it's, okay. it's, it's not today. No, no, no. The, you know that we we also recommend and this is more of a, a broader answer to the question, what we call the, the three D's of dementia, distract okay deflect, defer. So if someone is insistent that they have to leave the house because they have to go to work, mm -hmm. that, um, trying to distract them, changing the subject, saying, well, let's have a bite to eat first. Come on, let's, let's okay. sit down and have a bite to eat. Um, come over here, look at this thing on the television. Hey, did you see this thing in the paper? Let's look at some pictures of the grandkids. So distracting, uh, deferring. Yes, honey. Yes, honey. We're, we're going to do that. We're going to do that. But but wait five minutes. Come over here. I want to show you the, the flowers in the garden. It's okay. We have time. Um, you know, one of the other things is, um, I guess, that relates to this. A lot of patients with dementia are what I call unintentional Buddhists. That is, they are truly in the moment. Uh, and that if you can move them on to a different moment, that if that moment they're trying to leave the house because they're insisting they've got to catch a plane, and you're able to distract them and move them into a moment, they will then be in that moment and may forget about the fact that they were thinking they had to leave to, to you know, catch a flight. So That makes a lot of great sense. So it's not really lying, lying, it is helping someone to live in their own reality, as opposed to correcting them about 
your reality. Is that a fair statement? Absolutely. Absolutely. One of the other skills I recommend is, is I sort of ask family members and caregivers, you know, do they know the difference between karate and judo? And, you know, that they're both martial arts, but karate is where you meet a force with a force. And judo is more where you take the force that the person is directing at you and mm -hmm. you redirect it where you want it to go. And that when you are engaging with someone with dementia and you're trying to use logic and reason, mm -hmm. that's karate. Um, every time, you know, you don't go along with what they say, you contradict them, that's karate. Um, but distracting, deflecting, deferring, that's judo. That's sort of taking the energy that they're directing at you and trying to redirect it somewhere else. Well, it also sounds to me like that that approach would reduce conflict in the family and reduce the likelihood of violence or frustration that leads to danger or the person trying to run away from the situation, et cetera. It's just more calm. Certainly. That, that is the hope, is to try and minimize conflict. Um, and, and when conflict does inevitably come up, as it will, to de-escalate the, de the conflict. That is a good word, de-escalate. But you also raised something else about when conflict arises. Yes. And it seems to me that what I hear the most for things that, that where the conflict is, of course, you stole my stuff being number one, but close second is um, refusal to shower or bathe. Can we address how one can either encourage their loved one to shower or bathe or some of the reasoning behind what the problem is? Sure, I, I can do both. Uh, okay. To start with, um, Again, in patients with dementia, they tend not to realize that they have dementia. So they may not recognize they need assistance with showering, bathing, mm -hmm. dressing, what we generally refer to as personal care. So it is very understandable that there will be conflicts around this in that if you know someone, be it a, a spouse, an adult child, a paid caregiver, was to approach either of us anytime today and said, okay, let's take off your clothes, we're going to go in the shower, mm -hmm. we're going to refuse um, because we don't recognize that, that we might need assistance with that. And okay. when we are naked, we are vulnerable. Uh, that as a society, uh, nudity, vulnerability, that these are mm -hmm. things that are reserved, you know, for, you know, spouses and doctors, and that's about it. Yeah. So having someone come in, it's, it's a natural response to have resistance to bathing, dressing, other personal care things for all of these reasons. So how do we work around that? As gently as we can. Um, trying to force it, trying to explain it, tends not to work. Um, but um, offering supervision, doing explanation as one goes along, okay, well, let's, let's, let me just take off your shoes. Would that be okay? So asking permission, going slowly, not rushing, not, you know, conveying your frustration right. at, at the person's reluctance and, and resistance, um, staying calm in, in the moment. Um, these are things that can be helpful. Okay. And, and I assume other things like making the bathroom warm and the, sh the shower warm before the person gets in so it's not as traumatic and they're not freezing cold and hit with cold water. So Absolutely. Making the environment as pleasant as possible, soft lighting, putting on gentle music. I, I would add a couple things, okay. um, and maybe this is a personal opinion. Um, I don't think everybody needs to shower every day. Um, if someone's right. not having incontinence, if someone's not rolling around in the mud, if they're not outside sweating, they don't need to shower every day. And for some people who, if, you, if they refuse to shower, you can do what's called a warm towel bath or a sponge mm -hmm. bath. Um, and you keep them covered up. You uncover one part of their body at a time. You explain what you're doing. You wash it. You dry it. You cover it. You move on to the next body part. Um, not everyone has to have a shower, uh, and certainly not every day. 
Well, that's that's a great point, because I think the trade off that a lot of people lose is the need, quote unquote, for a shower or a bath versus just getting cleaned and how often that needs to be cleaned. And in a lot of people with who are older with thinner skin, you don't want the skin to dry out either. So um, one of my colleagues said, if you're doing a towel bath or using wet wipes, please warm the wipes like you would do you warm baby wipes. So I can I can see that that could be one of the challenges um, that actually kind of led to one of the questions about how to deal with incontinence. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, we, you and I understand it's not willful, but do you have any hints for how to encourage someone to toilet or is it you can't encourage them anymore? So what we often will recommend is uh, putting someone on what we call a toileting schedule, okay. whereby what we will ask them or the caregivers to do is every two hours or so to encourage the person to sit on the toilet, whether they feel like they need to go or not. Okay. Uh, and by doing so, you're more likely to empty things out and less likely to, to have incontinence. Uh, but generally, that's what we recommend. Sometimes people are agreeable, sometimes they're not, um, but we find that that can be very effective uh, in sort of just having, you know, while awake, of course, uh, right. you know, every two hours, let's go to the bathroom, let's sit down and let's, and let's see. Because people with dementia may not be able to convey that they need to go to the bathroom. They may not have the sensations that they need mm -hmm. to go to the bathroom. Um, so anticipating it, staying ahead of it often can be very effective. So it seems to me a lot of what you've said is to A, be flexible, B, be calm, and C, try to keep things on a schedule so that it becomes more of a routine and that you're not trying to force the person with dementia into a different world. You're basically working with what they have, what their ability is, and giving them comfort. I see now that it's time for us to go to a break. So this is your need to know, and we'll be back in just a few minutes. Caitlin, be serious. Now take the oath. Come on. I'm totally taking this seriously. Okay, I'm ready. You may begin. I pledge that I will never meet in person with anyone I first met online without checking with my parent or guardian. And? And furthermore, if my parent or guardian agrees to the meeting, it will be in a public place and my parent or guardian must come along. Do you pinky swear? I do. When you teach your kids about internet safety, they'll pass it on. For more information, go to cableclicksmart.org. Today I'm going to talk to you about physics. Come on in, girls. Let's go. This is the first rocket to get humans to Mars. Really tall. I'm a rocket structural engineer designing and building parts of the rocket. You are the generation that will be stepping foot on Mars. Do I have a group of astronauts on my hands? Yes. You can become a rocket scientist or whatever else you want to be. Opiates has taken everything and everyone I've ever loved away from me. Everything. I blew my ankle out and I got prescribed pain pills by my doctor. If making my detox public is going to help somebody, I'm all for it. I just wish I would have had a warning. Opioid dependence can happen after just five days. Know the truth. Spread the truth. Give your town a reason to celebrate, because every Goodwill item you bring home brings job training and more to your community. Goodwill, bring good home. Welcome back to Your Need to Know. I'm your host for today, Jody Lyons, and I'm here with Dr. Nicholas Shore, and we are discussing 
dementia. And right now we're going to discuss caregiver stress because in the past we were talking about the diseases and how it affects the person with dementia. Now let's talk about the people who are caring for those people with dementia. This is kind of a loaded question to start off with, so I'm sorry, Dr. Shore, but um, let's assume that there is no way to prevent caregiver stress, and correct me if I'm wrong. How are people supposed to deal with it? Sure. So caregiver stress, um, unfortunately, is the exception rather than the rule. There are many layers to caregiver stress. The act of caring for someone with dementia is just about a full-time job in and of itself in terms of supervision, making sure they're not engaging in any unsafe behaviors, mm -hmm. responding to their emotional needs as well as their general care needs as time goes on and they are less and less able to care for themselves. It is a 24-7 job and in and of itself, regardless of, of how much one loves the person that, that they are caring for, be it a spouse, a sibling, a parent, uh, it, it is a very difficult job. And all of this is being superimposed upon the fact that the caregiver is having to watch their loved one in the throes of this terrible yeah. disease, that they are seeing them decline before their eyes. They are seeing them change from the person whom they love into someone who is impacted by this disease and may behave very differently than you know the person who they used to be. So combining those two things is just profoundly stressful, which is why it, it is almost universal uh, amongst caregivers of, of a loved one with dementia. Um, so, so, yeah. How, how does the caregiver recognize that they need help or if they aren't going to, how do the people around them recognize they need help? Well, I, I think uh, oftentimes they will be ex they will be suffering themselves. They will be sad. They will be crying. They will feel hopeless, despondent. They may find themselves very angry or yelling at their spouse. So checking one's own emotional temperature. They may mm -hmm. present with fatigue. Uh, they may start to neglect themselves, not, not shaving, not changing their clothes. Um, they may be very reluctant to, to leave their loved one alone and, and not care to their own health needs. Um, okay. So uh, it, it can present a number of ways, but you know, generally it's, it's you know, their, their hearts are breaking. Um, and uh, I, I think my message to any caregivers would be, um, if you ask for help, whether it's from another family member, a neighbor, a professional caregiver, a friend, um, that does not mean that you can't hack it. That does not mean that you don't love the person that you're caring for. That it, it, it means you do love them because you're recognizing that you need help and you're going to make sure that you get the help that you need in order to help them. Um, so it's not a failure to ask for help. Not, it's a, actually, not at all. It's actually something positive. Absolutely. A ab absolutely. That, and taking care of your own needs and being able to say, I need to go out for an hour with friends. I need, mm -hmm. I need a break. I need to hire someone to come in for an hour. Or I need to ask the neighbor to come and sit with my loved one for an hour. Mm -hmm. So you are taking care of your needs. Makes you a better caregiver. Because... Uh, if, if you can't take care of yourself, you can't take care of anybody else. And, and burnout is a, a tremendous risk when caring for someone with dementia. Well, and I think we're seeing a lot more burnout these days after people were basically locked in together due to a pandemic. So that also kind of leads to the next step, which is what kind of help should a caregiver be seeking in addition to the can somebody come stay with the person I'm caring for while I get a haircut, sit in the sun, or I've had caregivers take the newspaper, move their car down a block and just sit in their car and read the newspaper. But how do you know when it's beyond that point 
and the person needs medical help, the caregiver needs medical help. Sure. So I, I think, you know, one of the general tools that, that I often recommend is knowledge. There are lots of resources that are available. And if caregivers are educating themselves about dementia, mm -hmm. educating themselves about uh, the symptoms that their loved one can demonstrate, uh, sites, websites such as the Alzheimer's Association, mm -hmm. excellent resources. Um, so the more educated one is, the more one understands, the more prepared they are. Uh, I think, you know, it can be very hard for caregivers themselves to judge when they need expert help, I think because of the, the previously mentioned issues that they may think it means I don't love them or it means I can't do it uh, mm -hmm. if I don't ask for help. So they may not themselves recognize it, that oftentimes it, it's not until things sort of hit rock bottom uh, where, you know, the fire department is called because the person with dementia really burned the house down because the caregiver was so burned out, you know, they, they were, you know, sleeping during the right. day. They were up all night with the person with dementia. Um, it, it can be hard to say. And, and, you know, my goal is I never want it to get to the point where emergency services are needed. And, and that's when we right. say, oh, when was the time? Oh, it was about two days ago. That was when the time was. Um, it can be very hard for caregivers themselves to recognize. And it really does take a, a communal effort, um, especially medical care providers. You know, a person with dementia theoretically has a primary care doctor, has a neurologist, someone who has assessed them, who is checking on them, mm -hmm. uh, evaluated them, and is monitoring them. They can be tremendous resources. Uh, geriatric care managers, folks such as yourself, Mm -hmm. and be tremendous resources into helping caregivers recognize that they need help and then also connecting them uh, to the resources for them to, to get that help. I, I only wish that caregivers would recognize that they are as valuable as human beings as the person they're caring for. You know, it's uh, one of my colleagues one time said, you can't pour from an empty pitcher. And there's just so much they can do. Um, and, and again, it's, I think also, it, it's interesting that when dementia is involved, there are sometimes fewer community supports than people think. Like if somebody has a new baby, everybody rushes and makes meals and says, you know, sleep when the baby sleeps. And people come in and say, let me babysit or I'll clean your house or you relax, I'll take care of the grocery shopping, the whatever. And I find that those offers aren't necessarily specifically made during the course of caring for someone with dementia. So, you know, I think one of the biggest things we all as a community have to develop is how to best help a caregiver. So, you know, not to get on my high horse, but that's one of my pet peeves. But here's a final question for you, Dr. Shore. And it's a loaded one, so I apologize. Um, when is it not okay for the caregiver to live with the person they're caring for? Sure. So it really comes down to safety, um, first okay. and, and foremost. So if the caregiver, for whatever reason, is not able to provide a safe environment for their loved one, and a lot of that may depend upon how the behavioral and psychiatric symptoms of dementia manifest in that particular loved one. Okay. Uh, but if they are not able to provide a consistently safe environment for that, that person. For both of them. Correct. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it is time uh, for the person to, um, you know, move somewhere that can provide them with that. I, I would say, you know, caveats to that include um, if the person would be more comfortable or more dignified in a different setting, uh, if a different setting can can provide the safety, uh, the comfort, greater stimulation, greater range of activities, opportunities for socialization mm -hmm. that are, are not able to be um, done at the home environment, that is another consideration. Uh, but it is it is safety you know, first and and foremost. 
Um, and so I'm, to not wait, sorry to interrupt that, but, but we don't want to wait until there's a safety issue, right? Like we correct. don't want to wait till the house fire, till the person wanders in the middle of the night or wait for the caregiver to be hit as opposed to pushed. I, I, I ideally, is okay. I, 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 ideally and, and I think okay. tying into, I guess, the previous section just very quickly, um, there are resources that are, are out there that these things can be done. There are supports for caregivers that are mm -hmm. out there. Um, there are uh, tons of uh, caregiver support groups. Yes. There are care managers that offer individual counseling. There is no mm -hmm. shame in a caregiver seeing a mental health professional, psychologist, psychiatrist, social worker, professional counselor to get their own support. There mm -hmm. absolutely is support out there. Um, it, it can be tremendously useful in helping caregivers realize they're not alone in, in this. Right. And that with the support comes knowledge, comes information, and is the best chance at prophylaxis and getting yes. to the point where we're preventative, just like you were talking about. That makes a lot of sense. And, and I think the key takeaways are, A, there's no shame in seeking help, and B, the positive of this is, it's very positive to seek help so that we can have the caregivers be as healthy as we need them to be, but they also need to recognize when it may not be okay anymore, and I always say, please plan in advance a little bit because you don't want to wait till 911 is involved. It's the middle of the night and then you're looking for getting something done. So get your legal and financial stuff in order first and then move on. Um, and I think to the people who support the caregivers that circle around the friend and family caregivers is apparently, if and I'm paraphrasing, recognize that your friend needs help and offer something specific is that reasonable yes and, and i would also add very quickly um don't wait until the emergency um because while there is help that's out there yeah especially amongst mental health professionals there are long waiting lists so the yes. sooner you reach out for help um the better it's going to be perfect and i think that's a great way for us to end Thank you so much, Dr. Shore. Our guest today has been Dr. Nicholas Shore, and this is your need to know. Thanks for joining.